Welcome everybody to this webinar organized by the International Association of Dredging Companies and the International Institute for Sustainable Development. My name is René Kolman and I'm Secretary General of the IADC. IADC is an international trade association working for privately owned and worldwide work working dredging companies. Our main task is informing uh, our stakeholders, and that can be clients, consultants, governments, port authorities, on what dredging is really about. And this is important because there is very often a misunderstanding on what dredging really is. Of course, dredging companies intervene in the environment, but it's not per definition that they destroy the environment, and that's what's often thought of. Um, we, uh, in, a lot of con in a lot of situations, the dredging company can add value to the environment or even create a new habitat. And in this webinar today, we will see that uh, with this project, we really create new habitat and we add value to the environment. Informing all our stakeholders, the public, etc. We do that in different ways. Uh, for instance, by organizing a webinar as this one today, but we also have a very uh, um, extended website with a lot of information on it. We publish facts about, we organize seminars, courses, and of course our flagship journal, Terra at Aqua. It's the only near scientific journal in the industry and all of you can have a free subscription on this journal when you visit our website. ISD will be introduced by Matthew Goet, who will do one of the three presentations uh, today, and so he will do that later on. Uh, for you, it's important to know that this webinar is recorded and the presentations and recording will be made available on our website in a couple of days. Today we will discuss the results of the sustainable asset valuation of the Honsbosse and Petema Sea Dunes project. This assessment is conducted by the International Institute for Sustainable Development on request of IADC. Sustainability is a key element for uh, our organization and in the portfolio of our activities. And to our opinion, it is a necessity to include externalities in your project valuations because that's the only way to get really sustainable projects. And the SAVI assessment facilitates uh, us in including all these externalities. It's not only about in cash cost and benefit, but it's also the inclusion of non monetized contributions of the project. We will start with the description of the need of the waterboard Holland's Noorderkwartier to fix a weak link in the Dutch coastal protection. After elaborating on the need, the contractor will inform us on his ideas and how he realized uh, the project. And in the end, the third presentation that will be done by IISD, and he will uh, review on the results made by the contractor to fulfill the needs of uh, the waterboard. If you have any clarifying questions, please raise your hand at the end of the, of the presentation and we will answer your questions immediately after the presentation. If you have some more in-depth questions, please put them in the chat uh, and we will discuss them after the three presentations of the presenters. Then we go over to the uh, presentations. Um, and first of all, I like to uh, give the floor to Jeroen Daniel. Jeroen is an advisor program management of the Dutch Waterboard Hollands Noorderkwartier, and he was involved of, at the project from the very early start. Please, Jeroen, go ahead. Thank you. And I will go over to my presentation. Here it is. Hello, uh, as told, I'm Jaron Daniel. I work with the Waterboard Holland's Noorder Quartier, and I was project secretary for the project that we used to know as the Weak Links North Holland. 
and which is now known as the Hondsbosse and Petemer uh, Sea Dunes. Um, the project was located in the north of Holland. I hope you can see my mouse move on the Dutch coast near to Alkmaar. Uh, and it was part of a series of weak links uh, along the coast. And they were executed in a national uh, high water protection program, a program in which the several water boards and the uh, Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water cooperate. Uh, here you can see the original situation um, between Pette in the north and Camperdijn in the south and a dike of six kilometers length. Uh, in the Middle Ages, the, the dunes that existed here were destroyed by storms. And since then, sea defenses were raised and then uh, uh, there was a long history of damages and repairs and damages and repairs. And in 2003, the, um, the, 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 the dike uh, uh, failed the safety test. It wasn't stable enough, it wasn't high enough, and it was weak uh, with, along the connections with the dunes. So we had to reinforce it. And we had a dual uh, purpose with the reinforcement. First of all, and most important, make it safe again. But secondly, to improve spatial quality in the area. And because of the, the goal to uh, improve spatial quality, uh, we tried to come up with solutions which could also benefit nature, uh, recreation and economy. And uh, we did this in a, in a long process with uh, the local people, stakeholders, uh, municipalities. Uh, and after a quite long process of, of participation uh, in which different solutions were invested, investigated and, and thought of, we uh, chose to uh, go for a completely sandy solution. Um, and the reason we chose for a sandy solution was that it was, uh, we thought that it could be realized, be realized quite fast. It would have less inv environmental impact, especially on the inside of the dike where there is a Nature 2000 area. And we figured that it would have more uh, opportunities for uh, recreation and nature and also it would be uh, more easily adaptable and flexible in the future. Um, we did it together with uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, Infrastructure. Uh, we really did the project together. There was a combined team. The, wa the water board was uh, responsible for the realization of the project and the ministry is uh, uh, responsible for the maintenance. And to also together with the province, who uh, took the part of um, uh, stimulating projects surrounding the, the, the dike reinforcement. But also, we did it, of course, with the, the contractors, with the people who really know how to make these things. Um, and we did this, uh, we, we tendered the contract as a design construct and maintenance. Uh, during a uh, competitive dialogue phase. Uh, and during this dialogue, uh, also the local stakeholders uh, were able to talk with the contenders of the, uh, uh, for the contract. Um, but the plan process and uh, asking for all the permits was in our hands. So what we did was we made our plans and said to the, to, to ask the, the contenders, um, is this enough space for your plan? And if not, then well, we, we fitted it so that in our plans, we you know every contender could make his plan within our plans. Uh, but what we actually showed in our plans was nothing more than this. You have the, the old sea defense, there's gonna be sand in front of it, that's it. Uh, and what the plans really were, we really didn't know until the day that we signed the contract with Van Oort and Boscalis and we could show the plans to everyone and to our great comfort all the local stakeholders said hey that's our plan um, but how that came about that's going to be the word uh, the talk of Eric I'm going to give the word back to you René Thank you, Jeron, for this presentation and uh, making clear the needs of uh, the water board. 
Um, I didn't get any uh, clarifying questions in the meantime, so I hand over to uh, Erik van Eeklen, who will present the solution of the contractors and how this solution was realized. Erik is a manager of the uh, environmental engineering department at Van Oort, and he's also project manager slash board member of EcoShape. Please, Erik, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, René. And indeed, I will also put up front my presentation. Here we go. So indeed, uh, it's, it's a delight to be here uh, today to, uh, to, talk, uh, to talk with you about say, the construction and the building with nature aspects of the, the Honsbosse Dunes, as the area is now called. Uh, indeed, uh, my, I, my name is Erik van Ekelen. I'm a program manager at EcoShape and I'm manager of the environmental engineering department with Vernoord. Hey, and this presentation, I have to state, has been uh, uh, developed uh, predominantly uh, 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 with, uh, with the work of the, the, the winning combination, uh, uh, van noord boskades combination, which was called the combinatie Zwakke Schakels Noord-Holland. So, um, I'm going to highlight a little bit about the, the design of the tender process. Uh, uh, highlight some, uh, some things about the construction and building with nature aspects in, in our final solution. So, um, Looking to the uh, design and, uh, and, and tender process, that of course starts with the design requirements. Eh? And, and as Jaron stated, eh, it was clear that uh, uh, sand needs to be used. And uh, next to that, eh, we need to meet safety requirements uh, with a particular design life of 50 years, also with re in relation to sea level rise. Uh, the maximum dune light was maximized so that say uh, from the uh, landscape site where this iconic dike has always been, you wouldn't see that there was a uh, dune on the seaward side uh, beyond it. The coastline should be sufficiently smooth um, and all sorts of uncertainties should be taken into account. Uh, but, and that was actually him, but also very prominent in this environmental quality in relation to recreation, infrastructure and nature was to be included as well. So there, hè, so, hè, and this is then basically the area hè, where we're talking about, that's where the, the, the dike currently is, and uh, sand needs to be placed in the, uh, in front of, uh, of that to, uh, to, to, to organize it. So the design philosophy that we as contractors uh, uh, upheld was hè, to say, it, okay, we're going to make a sort of a minimum equilibrium profile that's needed, of course, hè, uh, don't make too much because that is going to cost. Uh, but uh, next to that minimum equilibrium profile, we need also to have some buffer in there to compensate for any losses during the maintenance period that was part of it. And that is going to be the amount of uh, sand that we're going to place. Uh, so we are really talking about optimal use of available sand, uh, but also so maximum technical spatial quality and uh, minimization of any nuisance. So in the cross profile that actually uh, looks uh, looks uh, quite clear eh? so uh, uh, there is uh, uh, basically here we're coming actually starting from the back we need a particular dune width in order to assure that uh, the sea is protected then there is an equilibrium profile of the uh, beach and a sort of a closure depth in which we go to the to the, to the foreshore well and this closure depth and equilibrium profile were based on um, uh, the cross profiles uh, in, the, in the surroundings of the, of the work. And the dune width calculation uh, was actually based on uh, safety calculations as, as, as we know it. Uh, huh? And that uh, these are the, uh, uh, for uh, uh, the, 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 the um, basically what you calculate at design depth, the balance of how much sand is available in the dune um, uh, to be taken off during such an event, and that there then is uh, uh, still sufficient uh, basic profile standing there. And you can uh, calculate uh, all of that. We have the tools available in the Netherlands for that. Um, so in the design overview uh, that you then get, uh, so that's cross profile, but then of course we have also a long profile, in which we have different zones, uh, recreational zones on the southern end, a nature zone in the middle, and a recreational zone on the northern end. Uh, and then, of course, in the longshore profile, there also needs to be buffers for sand losses, as of course, this is extending from the current sea profile, so probably some erosion is going to take place. Uh, uh, the smoothening of the aerial design was, of course, necessary, uh, yielding that you would have uh, uh, to couple here uh, additional sand on the top and uh, uh, on the northern part and on the southern tip. And of course, we needed to introduce all of these added values. Well, these added values included nature aspects 
such as a wet dune valley that we've uh, we've introduced in the middle of the of, of the nature area. We've actually created an, an area uh, where we have a front row uh, of, of, of dunes and then uh, there is a, a wet, wet dune valley. So basically uh, uh, fresh water that's going to be collected, uh, collected there. Uh, that is uh, that is enclosed uh, uh, and then afterwards you get an, an another dune ridge. So that's actually how we made it. And so at the in the middle point where the uh, whole um, dune is the widest, we are creating this. And actually this wet dune valley is a natural habitat uh, that is actually no long uh, on, on uh, no longer existing on other parts of the Dutch coast. So we are really reintroducing an, uh, a key uh, a key and valuable habitat uh, with uh, with this uh, with this dune valley. And of course, also in a recreational sense, it's also very nice to visit as well. Uh, another point that we found really important uh, and, 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 and really added in order to assure uh, that values are created is the introduction of accessible dunes. Uh, and here you see the northern tip. As indicated, we are building these dunes in front of it. So at this connection point, uh, where uh, what was the connection point between the old uh, uh, dike and the new uh, and, uh, and, and, and the old dunes, uh, right in front of there, you get of course uh, a new uh, dune landscape, and we really looked to accessibility of uh, of, of of that. Uh, on the southern end, we uh, added actually a recreational lagoon. So again, you see here that where, uh, where uh, the dunes needed to be uh, uh, connected to the new dune system, and actually we needed quite a lot of sand here in the front end to act as a buffer for uh, ongoing erosion in, during the maintenance period. We behind that buffer area, we actually created this um, uh, additional recreational lagoon, um, uh, which is a sort of a lower lagoon, and of course uh, it's a very safe place for, uh, to, uh, for, for kids to swim. And then other elements are infrastructure, so cycling paths, uh, uh, walking paths, uh, horse riding paths are, in, are, are introduced as well. So that's about design. So uh, we've integrated all of these elements. And then of course, uh, when the design is there, you can actually start working. And uh, no, we didn't do it with uh, hand, uh, hand carriers that uh, were uh, shown in, uh, in the picture of Jaron. Most of the work was carried out by trailer suction hopper dredges, like you see them in, uh, see them in action here. And then, so basically staging the uh, building of all of this center, it starts with foreshore works where the trailers would come and bottom dump their materials in the, in the foreshore in front of the dike. Then the next stage is uh, making a beach, uh, so uh, 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 making, uh, making the beach profile, and then directly afterwards we could, uh, on top of that beach, uh, close to the dike, start and build up the, the dune as well. And then we worked from south to north, we've built up this whole landscape. Of course, uh, it isn't all there when the sand is all there because that, uh, that was actually the main, uh, main part of the trick. Eh? So, uh, so here you see uh, helm grass planting taking place. Eh? In the top you see uh, how that is done. And in the, uh, on, on, on the main picture you can really nicely see what that actually in planting helm grasses. We have not only placed it, uh, say, as many helm grass as possible to uh, make sure that the er erosion is, uh, wind erosion is protected, but we actually leave left open. Uh, some uh, some spaces and we've created some small variations to sort of kickstart natural variations and really natural dune development. Yeah. And then of course also what you see uh, is that the wet dune uh, valley was uh, was to be developed uh, and dug out and also the lagoon. Uh, additional works were necessary to prepare that uh, for the for the final stage. And so actually in this picture you quite nicely see uh, how the different stages work. So uh, the sand is still ongoing in the beach. Uh, right behind it is still here from this side onwards. The dune is being built and then all the preparation works uh, follow, uh, follow that nicely working from south to north. So uh, in the end, say, uh, we are always referring to this project as a key example of building with nature. Uh, and building with nature is actually a design philosophy that really looks that when you are going to make uh, uh, in hydraulic infrastructure, uh, uh, like uh, flood protection, uh, that you on the one hand use natural forces. Uh, so in this case, you knew you use the dunes and sandy foreshore uh, to uh, make sure that the, uh, the sediment the sediment balance is regulated of this coastal zone in order to assure that there is su sufficient sediment to uh, make the protection. Uh, and then on the other hand, 
you also provide opportunities for nature to develop. Eh? So uh, we here we have definitely uh, used say the opportunities uh, for um, in making this landscape. We really use them to create these uh, uh, these dune habitats. Uh, that uh, and, 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 and the wet June Valley habitat, for instance, that is really valuable to the Dutch coast. Hey, so, and actually, EcoShape had the honors to, uh, uh, after the project was finished, to actually really look uh, in an innovation project to uh, see whether, uh, uh, say, uh, whether these developments, as they were uh, uh, considered or initiated during design and construction work, Whether they, whether and how they were actually taking place, eh? and uh, in that innovation project, eh, we focused on habitat development, and also eh, can you now really predict this habitat development eh, in the way that we did? We've looked to morphological developments, eh, and again, prediction is necessary for future design optimization, and we also looked at public perception in this uh, innovation project. So to conclude, eh, and a final overview slide in which you again see how. Um, the the the, the, the dunes are being constructed. Uh, I think what is really necessary is that adding value for nature and recreation was really part of our integral part of our approach. Um, nature and recreational value is in that sense then really designable and constructible, and we really use the building with nature approach using natural forcing to uh, enable to optimize our our design. But then the final point is, of course, eh, say we really appreciate that, that this has led to the award and the, uh, the, the possibility to construct this. But now our main question is, how can we now really express this value? And uh, so we were really happy to hear that the IASD uh, um, uh, uh, was, uh, was happy enough to, to look to this project and provide this valuation. So I'm really looking forward to the presentation of Matt, who will conclude on this. Thank you very much. Over to you, René. Thank you for this presentation a very clear presentation so again no questions from uh, from the audience yeah some uh, some applause for you eric thanks um i hand over to uh, matt uh, guet from the iisd he uh, will present uh, the results of the sustainable asset uh, valuation of this project matt is a sustainable finance analysis of the iisd and the iisd is a canadian think tank on sustainable development so Please, uh, Matt, show the results and introduce yourself and the organization. Yeah, everybody can see my slides OK? Yeah. Um, yeah, so yes, my name is Matt Gowett. I am a senior advisor in sustainable finance at the International Institute uh, for Sustainable Development. We are currently in the process. Uh, we're in a five year project right now that is supported by the Global Environment Facility, as well as the Mava Foundation, where we will be doing assessments on what we classify as nature-based infrastructure and to help build the evidence around the importance of um, what Eric might refer to as building with nature, but again, what we say is investments into nature-based infrastructure. So this is how we came to this project and obviously uh, would like to thank uh, Yaron and Eric for their help in gathering data and obviously Renee uh, managing the project all the way through. So with that, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our methodology and we can talk uh, a little bit more about some of our findings. So what we do is we have a process called the Sustainable Asset Valuation Method or what we call a SAVI. And what this does is it looks to quantify and compare the benefits and costs of, of a, of a nature-based infrastructure solution. So it goes a little, it goes beyond a traditional CBA as we're trying to bring in these kind of the avoided costs in this case of uh, what would have happened if there was a flood that it would, would happen, or um, what sometimes we'll look at yeah, numerous different um, avoided costs or additional benefits. So in this case of that uh, we're talking about today and the one that that Eric had brought up that had brought up a lot of the additional benefits that we saw come from this project were based on this idea of tourism uh, or the increased recreational use of this area. Obviously with um, the cycling and what have you and these uh, different nature paths we think that there would be a benefit to uh, people's health 
the increased biodiversity that uh, Eric was speaking about, possibly some discussion of increased property values because you're now next to a, uh, a nicer a nicer area. And I, I believe that Yaron had mentioned this idea of the flexibility that the dudes could provide um, from a construction aspect. You can always be adding to the dunes. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at all these benefits of the dune project and then compare them to against what we would call the uh, a gray solution or which would have been an upgrade to the the sheet pile wall that at a very large at a very macro extent is how we undertook this assessment so jumping right to the results and we'll walk through the results in more detail but uh, what we found is that the sand dunes are a, a superior investment under all the scenarios um, they have a positive value even even if they were not to avoid a single cost with uh, and a lot of this value is generated from the predicted tourism boost that would come as well as the lower lifetime costs of uh, of having the dunes instead of a great solution the one thing that we did um, find was that to be per perfectly frank, we we feel that we may have underestimated to a certain extent some of these avoided costs and added benefits. And what I mean by that is we ne we didn't necessarily put monetary values on this idea of increased biodiversity or this increase in health or the, the idea that uh, again Yaron had had mentioned with the idea of the flexibility of uh, of the actual construction itself. We we didn't feel comfortable at this point putting as a monetary values on that. Um, so with with those benefits added in, we actually think that our our estimate is of the extra benefits that the dunes provides is actually uh, quite conservative. So just to take you through a little bit of our process, we always start from a what we call a causal loop diagram. So, oh, sorry, I went, went too far ahead there. So a causal loop diagram um, for you that might not know, and you know, up until about a year ago, I had no idea what a causal loop diagram is. Um, it's an analytical tool that basically portrays the dynamics of a system. So it is our first step where we try to demonstrate or go through and walk through the interconnectedness of key what we call socioeconomic indicators and see where they link in with the environmental indicators in this as a very complex diagram that we're looking at right now you'll see that orange variables or or orange um, titles what they represent are possible policy interventions or different things that can be done with pink with the pink variables being um, kind of the climate inputs and as you can see there's positive and negatives and uh, and this is representing how the externalities will flow from these different interventions again we won't spend too much time on this i just wanting to show you how our thinking starts in in one of these studies assessments in the case of this uh, assessment we try to again very try to simplify it um, to to make our assessment to I would say kind of make sense a little bit more to uh, an outward uh, an outward audience. What I wanted to show in this is that we know or we we believe or when turn we worked with the assumption that a sheet pile wall and the dunes to a certain extent would deliver similar services to the to the area regardless of whether one alternative was chosen or another. So again, some of the elements, it, both both alternatives would have delivered flood protection with regards to protecting agriculture, ag agricultural activity in the area, um, carbon se sequestration of the inside of the vegetation around the area, as well as a lot of the water purification um, so that you wouldn't have the, uh, you wouldn't have let's say phosphorus or nitrogen going into the waters under a flood under a flood scenario where obviously where we know this differs or where we are assuming this differ, differs is that the dune is offering uh, um, a significant increase in tourism 
and this is something that we we were able to discuss and and verify with local uh, with local stakeholders. So taking a step further, our first step is to okay, where where is the area that we're looking at? You can see from this map, um, this is this is the area that we were studying. I would I would highlight that we we believe that this is quite a um, conservative estimate of the area. And what we mean by that is that if there was a flood, um, unfortunately, you know, with restrictions on travel, we don't we would normally go out to the area and and I would say put our eyes on the area. Um, with restrictions on travel, we didn't get there, but we have been assured by most people that we we've discussed the project with that if there was a flood, the actual impacted area would be much larger than this. That being said, um, we want to be again as conservative as, as possible. Um, this area here is roughly um, 911 uh, hectares, uh, of which about 60% of that is cropland or agricultural land, and about 15% are the two, are what we would call residential, or the two villages of, of Petten and, and Camper Doom. And then inside of this area, again, just to highlight, um, and this will, this comes out in our analysis is that there is about 45,000 tons of carbon that is stored in this area as well. So carbon that is sequestered inside of the vegetation that would leach out if there was a uh, if there was a flood. We we use this data uh, obviously to then figure out how much nitrogen and phosphorus is stored in the ecosystem um, and that is avoided because because of the flood protection that would be afforded by the dunes as well as the gray as well as the gray infrastructure and we use this in our calculations the the this data here to um, to then put a monetary value on what that what these avoided costs are and work that into our financial analysis One thing that I wanted to flag is um, what we did in this in, for this analysis, which is I think somewhat different than um, other analysis or similar analysis that we've seen in for um, I would say flood protection scenarios is we did not follow a probabilistic scenario. Um, we did very much a deterministic scenario. And what I mean by that is instead of saying, well, there is a one in 10,000 year flood, and this is, you know, we're going to scale all of these benefits and costs based on that. We looked at it differently and said, what happens if there is one flood against which the existing structure would not protect? We very much, we, we wanted to look at what happens if there is one flood in the next, or a, a potential flood in the next 50 years, if there was two potential floods in the next 50 years, if there was three potential floods in the next uh, 50 years, that the dunes and or even a great uh, great sheet pile wall would protect against. So we very much took it from that scenario um, and then extrapolated our, our calculations based on that. So turning to the financial analysis and some of our findings from that. And it might be a little bit, it's quite a, uh, quite a lot of data, it might be a little bit difficult to, to, to get to, but you can see our monetary estimates. In this case, uh, the sand dunes, which are the two columns to the right, show that they are far and far and away a superior investment than a sheet pile wall. And again, you can see from the um, from the analysis that much of this benefit is from the increased tourism revenue that is expected. Um, in many cases, what we call the avoided cost, which is related to whether it be avoided let avoided, I'm sorry, the loss of agricultural productivity or let's say avoided phosphorus pollution. That is all, it's the same between the sheet pile wall and the sand dunes. So 
uh, very much what is driving our analysis or driving our findings, we know is this tourism benefit. In this, in this chart here, we are obviously talking about what would happen if there was one flood avoided or two floods avoided. Um, we took this analysis, we, we show this for simplic uh, simplicity at this point, but if we took this analysis further, and just to show that, we can actually show what would have happened if there's actually no floods avoided or if there's three floods avoided. The one thing that I would highlight there is that even if there was not a flood avoided, the artificial, the, the, the sand dune itself is, is actually still a positive investment over the lifetime of the investment. So it's actually, um, it's got a positive net present value. So that is something that it, what we have been colloquially refer, referring to it amongst our project group is it's a no regret solution. You, you, you know, you're, you're going to be ahead. Um, whereas that would maybe not be the case if the, um, you know, if there was a sheet pile wall investment made. Realizing that these are estimates, um, we took on a, a fabulous suggestion from Renee, our host today, to um, to show a certain amount of sensitivity analysis and, and what would happen if only 80% of these benefits and avoided costs were realized, um, or even if, I say, we were too conservative in our estimates and that if there was a uh, if there's actually more benefits and avoided costs realized over the time periods that we've looked at. Again, I would be happy to share this presentation. I know I'm going through all these facts and figures pretty quickly, but I'm happy to share this presentation afterwards for anyone. Um, but again, happy, uh, very happy to show that in all, all cases, the sheet pile wall um, under, well, I shouldn't say, the, the, the dunes overperforms or, or outperforms a great solution. So how do our, should we be interpreting the results with a nod to the consideration of uh, some of the limitations of our studies? Again, just to highlight that we didn't really talk about, we weren't able to take on the health benefits from the increased uh, tourists in the areas and, and again, all these different paths that Eric was referring to. Um, we did not quantify the psychic benefit of, of people obviously visually seeing something that is, I would say, more appealing um, and living in that area, as well as knowing that they have better flood protection. Um, we did not look at the biodiversity impacts um, or possible synergies with a Natura uh, 2000 site that's also in the area. Um, and we didn't necessarily quantify the adaptability uh, of the dunes and, and again this kind of flexibility that um, that Yaron had had mentioned at one point. Um, we would also say and, and it's very very important that we recognize this that this analysis that we've done is, is built upon uh, the social co cost benefit analysis that Arcadis had done previously so definitely want to make sure that that is um, definitely recognized because they've they had done quite a bit of uh, of the upfront work and a lot of the hard work on this. So I appreciate the work that they had done on that. And then finally, um, obviously, Eric had kind of brought this up and it's something that, you know, happy to talk about further is that, you know, how can we use these results and, and who does this benefit? Um, I think for us, you know, we would look at this and say, you know, the public authorities or the funders, um, you know, uh, the government, the water board, um, this helps justify your the investment, right? This helps justify that you know building with nature, nature-based solutions, nature-based infrastructure are good investments. Um, they obviously are adding to tourism and local development. They they are functionally cl climate adaptation in you know in practice. Um, the increased biodiversity is 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 a huge is a huge. Uh, you know, benefit to the area and, and it's something that we should uh, continue to pursue. From uh, maybe from Eric's Eric's point of view and, and some of the people on the on the presentation today, this discussion of, you know, from the construction sector and, and the judging companies is 
is establishing a business case for the MBI and, and showing that you know this these nature-based infrastructure um, have demonstrable benefits that are not necessarily always captured by traditional cost benefit analysis. And I think this is a great example of that. And we hope to do similar work uh, going forward on this. And then finally, um, you know, civil society and, and organizations, farmers, tours, you know, the tourism sector. We hope that, you know, people in this area uh, or people that are uh, um, considering taking this type of project on could look at a report like ours and realize that there are these societal benefits that come along with this type of work um, and that this type of work or these type of dunes can really promote climate adaptation and mitigation. So that is our is our feeling on that. With that, I will turn it back to Renee. I want to thank everybody for um, joining today and I would encourage anybody if you want to know or see the actual report it, it, on our website, it's on the, at the MBI Global Resource Center, um, as well as numerous other projects that we've worked on. So thank you again for joining and uh, yeah, Renee, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Matt, for your uh, presentation. Um, apparently this was new for some of uh, the, the people joining us today because now I, I got some uh, uh, questions. So that's very good. Thank you uh, uh, participants for this. Um, we will make uh, in the, we will, as said already, we will make the presentations and the recording available on the website and to the presentations, we will add a list of uh, websites where you can find more information of the organizing uh, organizations but also where you can find the report uh, Matt referred to. Um, I think it's uh, it's good to just go to the questions I received in uh, in the in the chat. Um, Annelies Boerema, well known uh, at least at IADC, but probably also at uh, at Eric, uh, he also knows her. Uh, uh, and just read the question, Matt. You mentioned direct benefits of tourism direct income, but did you also consider indirect effects of increased tourism? For instance, the negative for natural dune development, biodiversity. So can you? Yeah, so so that is, I think that for us was one of the reasons why we struggled a little bit, including this biodiversity uh, benefit cost. Um, you know, we, we know that there are um, and this is something that we discussed, I think, with both as as a group at one point that we have that biodiversity and capturing um, whether there is an increase or a decrease in biodiversity is very much a a long term, a longer term analysis, something that we'll have to have to play out and was not something that um, with this being built in in 2014, IASD was not necessarily, um, you know, I would say kind of involved in the project or the the preparation of the project so we wouldn't have done been able to do like a biodiversity um we wouldn't be able to have caught let's say the change so it was something that we were mindful of and then wanted to kind of make sure that we took a um that not, didn't necessarily include something that as a benefit without necessarily um some of these indirect costs that it could have happened can i um, does it meet your uh Question, uh, yeah, you can add an additional question to it. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's maybe also not only biodiversity, but also the impact on the carbon sequestration, nutrients circling. Uh, your presentation was short and quick, uh, so I didn't get all the details of, of what you quantified and, and how you did it, um, but also on, on these uh, processes and, and services, it can have an influence. Yeah, so we didn't necessarily look at the again how the how the construction phase would have um, would have impact like had a negative impact of maybe unsettling carbon or or um, how nitrogen or phosphorus may have have come into the um, yeah kind of come into the the surrounding uh, rivers and streams as a, as a result of the construction. No, we did not we did not bring that on. Like there was not. Basically, what we looked at is how much um, nitrogen or, or phosphorus was being held in in those areas because 
uh, and carbon for that matter, because there is flood protection there. Okay, so not in the dunes itself? No. Okay. No, and much more in the, um, the, the spatial area that we look at. Uh, I refer to the to the report again because mm -hmm. it goes much more in depth and it will clarify sure. much of uh, your questions, uh, Annelies. Sure. I have a second uh, question from uh, of uh, Tom Wilms. Uh, he thanks you for the presentation, Matt. But uh, your an analysis seems comparable with the cost traditional socio-economic cost-benefit analysis. What are similarities and what are differences? Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think um, and thinking back to a lot of the great information that was provided by Arcadis, I, I think what we were looking at doing is um, was really looking at some of these environmental um, these environmental impacts again, the carbon sequestration, the um, the phosphorus cap, the phosphorus and nitrogen that was stored, net net. Um, obviously, there you know we present them as there is not much of a difference between uh, um, the sheet pile wall and the MBI because you're avoiding a flood with one and you're avoiding a flood with another. Um, so I, it was um, it is not necessarily vastly I would say very, like vastly different than the the results that were presented by Arcadis in the past. Um, what we would say is you know I think. Uh, we were able to maybe contextualize a little bit some of those environmental benefits that that held. Yeah, that's uh, sufficient, uh, Tom. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Matt. I have a question from uh, Stephanie Eif. If you did any qualitative analysis assessment on the other values like biodiversity that you could not give a monetary value, Is the, the question is clear? Uh, yeah. 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 So on the biodiversity front, and 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 maybe I'll flip this over to to the two gentlemen, um, the two other gentlemen, see if they have a point on it. But we, again, we the indication that was given to us was that there was not necessarily um, strong evidence one way or the other whether there was a net net biodiversity gain or not from a qualitative side. But again, uh, the two other gentlemen on the call would or on the presentation would know better than I. Um, from a from a tour, like from the the health benefits and, and uh, the tourism, we did talk to uh, a local aldersman who says that there has been an increased activity in the area because of what's uh, what's been happening again. And we were we have linked that to a health benefit that we didn't necessarily like. We didn't quantify that. Jiron, do you have anything to add to that? No, not not really. As well as Stephanie, of course not. We we've done a couple of years of monitoring the the the, the effect on the growth of biodiversity. And if if there's one thing to to learn from this project that we should have taken before more time and resources to continuate those monitoring and studies to, to, to get more results. Um, it wasn't a, it wasn't a clear task or, or, or thing that we set out. Well, oh, we want to reach this this kind of level and we know that things are developing and, and we keep an eye on it, but we don't have really hard figures on it. So that's definitely something to improve for a next uh, assessment, more monitoring, probably upfront baseline monitoring and monitoring yes. after. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think I think that is that is indeed the main thing that we have learned from this this assessment. Uh, so you can of course uh, and 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 we are uh, as EcoShape, uh, uh, Re and 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 actually as all the partners together, really learning about say what values are being uh, are, are being developed on these new dunes, and we are looking to 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 a multitude of aspects there. But if say in your assessment you haven't done a proper assessment. Um, evaluation of the, the before uh, values, it, it's going to always be a difficult discussion because it, um, um, there is some uh, some value has been lost. There was a harp substrate uh, by the and, and associated biodiversity, which is now covered in sand. So I mean, and that is uh, that is a loss. And we are, I think, as all of the team, we were convinced that say the gains with the biodiversity and the new habitats that are. Uh, that are um, 
that are that are related. Um, uh, that that these are, that these outweigh uh, uh, that these outweigh sort of the 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 the, the, the costs that we made here. But uh, yeah, we indeed we don't have data. Thank you, uh, Eric, uh, for your additional remarks. Um, Jeroen, um, I have a question from uh, Eric Payen. How did you manage to convince the authorities to take the risk, so-called risk, to go for the nature-based solution? And will you make, after this experience, uh, nature-based solutions as a standard solution for next projects? Well, yeah, I think it's it, it it is one of the solutions that we have in our in our in our toolbox now, um, and it is in line with with the national uh, policy to to go soft where possible and hard where necessary. So it, no, it wasn't an easy decision in the time uh, to do something completely different here, but there was uh, uh, both politically and within the water board and. Uh, we decided to go for it. Uh, we, we, we we figured that this was this was uh, uh, the way to go, um, and we did it. And in, in in response to the to the question of Stephanie, yeah, we think that well, it 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 our expectations were were very yeah they 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 were made and even 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 better. Um, it's one of the things that I found really. Uh, uh, Illustrating was um, in the south, uh, at, uh, next to Eric's ear, there is a, a beach pavilion, Straun. Um, and when the construction started, within a couple of months, they completely redid their outside terrace because they had less uh, uh, sand blowing on, on their terrace because the, 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 the beach was, was wider and they had more people coming. So you, you could see the, the, the development of tourism and economy, especially in Camperdijn, you could see it happening while the, while the project wasn't even finished yet. Yeah, something, something's really changed in, in the area and uh, the, the project uh, did that. So this is definitely something we have to to promote and to tell the world that uh, this this is a a really benefit of uh, using nature based uh, solutions. Yes, and and no, and and after this one, we did the same in Tessel, where where we made a dune outside in the, in the water sea, and right now in the, the marker marker Meer, the lake uh, at at Horen, we we were doing a sandy uh, beach on the outside in the water and. Uh, We'll be recreating the biggest uh, uh, city beach in, in Europe, or so I'm told. At least the biggest in the Netherlands. You, you mentioned already one of the things you would improve in future projects as more monitoring. Are there other things that you should do differently having in mind such an assessment? And then I go along all the three of you. May, may, maybe the, the the initiator of this project first, Jerome. What well, what 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 we uh, we really challenged the contender or the, the tendering parties to to give us something extra, to give us something extra on re recreation, on nature, and on and and it was quite open how to do it. So we ended up with a lot of gifts, really really nice presents. But um, after you you unpack those presents, then it's okay. And wh whose present is this actually? Who's going to own it? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to uh, make sure that, that that in five years it's still a nice present and not something that you only put out when they come to visit? Um, and that has been uh, quite a long process with with the municipalities and Rijkswaterstaat. Like, okay, who's going to take care of this in in the future? Um, and that is something that we have thought on. Okay, in in next tenders, and if there's something like an economically most valuable uh, uh, process, and how to deal with that. On the other hand, if they would have given us this plan, which is really beautiful, we would have probably argued for four years with all the parties. Okay, who's going to take this? And it would never have been made. So. It was a good solution, but it, it made us wary in in the next projects to to be to be sharp on that point. Thank, thank you, uh, Jerome. Eric, uh, 
Do you see any? Yeah, I think what you see is really that these the the, the six enablers uh, that we see for for building with nature uh, that you see really them uh, them at play here. Of course, uh, the, today we focused on the enabler uh, business case, highlighting that there are uh, next to cost differences for nature-based infrastructure there are also a lot of profit differences, and that that creates actually opportunity. Uh, uh, technological wise, I can of course highlight a little bit the parts and the ideas of the of the design. So that's about technology and system knowledge. Stakeholders, um, uh, the process was mentioned by uh, by uh, by Aaron and is actually key to success because it's that public perception that it needs to turn. And you can only do that when you have a multi-stakeholder approach that you really take it along. Uh, Jaron already uh, cut all the grass away with regards to management, monitoring and maintenance that you need to organize. Uh, uh, but also the uh, an, an, uh, institutional embedding is an, is a, is an important part. Uh, and here you see that actually in the Netherlands we are quite far uh, that we know how to calculate on uh, this uh, type of sandy solutions. We know how to calculate um, the, 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 the flood protective value of that. And we have actually rules and uh, rules and, and uh, but you see that that with other nature based solutions that is actually sometimes a little bit more difficult and we should sort of worldwide assure that we uh, develop standards for that so that we can uh, can, can work with those. Uh, and that brings also the final part and that's what we're actually doing today is uh, capacity building. Uh, we it, it must be the understanding that uh, this is the way forward eh? and, and, and actually Eric uh, the, 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 had the question is how uh, were the authorities uh, convinced to take the risk. Well, luckily they also saw the opportunity. So and I think that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's pretty much the case, and that would be always the uh, always the case when we want to promote nature-based infrastructure. Uh, we people really also need to see the opportunity. Thank you, Eric. Then Matt, you as last. Yeah, Any no. Learn? Yeah, like I, I I think maybe not so much learn, but or the importance to that I hope that a lot of people on this call and and you know and is to export this idea. Um, obviously. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of countries that don't necessarily have the same um, thinking or as Eric was talking about the institutional capacity to implement some of these some of these ideas how to bring those uh, to bring those municipalities to bring those uh, provinces or countries along so that they um, they can consider this kind of this kind of work because we think from a, a climate adaptation mitigation standpoint that this is a superior solution if we can also demonstrate that it's, that it's also financially advantageous as well. Um, we really see this as an as an opportunity and, and something that, um, you know, from a very like, you know, we're, a, you know, we're a sustainable development think tank. We like would love to see this kind of idea, you know, exported across the world. Thank you. I'd like to thank you the three guys uh, for doing this nice uh, this nice presentations. Um, I'd like to thank the audience uh, and also those who put forward very engaging uh, questions. Uh, as said already, the presentations and the slides will be made available in a couple of days on the uh, IADC website. And then I'll also take the opportunity to promote an activity of uh, IISD that Matt mentioned already the Nature Based Infrastructure Center. Um, this center, part of IIS, IISD, will organize a MOOC about nature based infrastructure for climate adaptation and sustainable development. And they provide online material, uh, online uh, learning material, but also uh, workshops. Uh, a link to this uh, website, we will put it. Uh, um, in, uh, we will add it to the presentations, but it will also be shown after the closing video made by EcoShape of the Honsbosse Dunes project. And in this, uh, and after the, the video, we will uh, show a slide with the web address of uh, uh, of this uh, nature-based uh, infrastructure center. The video takes uh, six minutes. For this moment, once again, I. Thank the presenters. I thank you as an audience and hope to see you at the next webinar of IADC. Dit is een nieuw stukje Nederland. Vier jaar geleden bestond dit helemaal niet. Eigenlijk is dit heel bijzonder. Ik heb veel in de duinen gespeeld en mijn vader had een tuinerij tegen de duinen aan. Dus uh, zand is wel mijn ding. En ik ben er ongelooflijk trots op dat ik dit heb mogen aanleggen als een, een heel groot duingebied.
De Honsbossen en Pettemerzeewering. Ooit een zwakke schakel in de Hollandse kustlijn. Nu is dit gebied een voorbeeld van succesvolle kustverdediging en nieuwe natuur. De Honsbossen duinen. Over een afstand van zo'n 8 kilometer werd hier ruim 35 miljoen kubieke meter zand neergelegd. In het centrale deel van de versterking is ruimte voor de natuur en aan de noord- en zuidkant zijn gebieden voor recreatie gecreëerd. Die dijk die daar ligt, die moest worden versterkt en uiteindelijk is ervoor gekozen om niet de dijk te versterken, maar een nieuw duingebied aan te leggen zeewaarts van de dijk. Je kan deze dijk 6, 7 meter omhoog doen en allemaal stenen eromheen. We dachten, ja, dat levert geen extra dingen op. Dus we hebben een groot strand gemaakt, zowel noord als zuid. En in het tussenliggende gedeelte ontstaat weer allemaal nieuwe natuur. Nou, dan voeg je wat toe aan dit gebied. Je ziet hier meerwaarde voor natuur en meerwaarde voor de recreatie. Terwijl je ook de belangrijkste punten hoogwaterveiligheid ook in voorziet. En uh, dat is eigenlijk precies de ambitie van Ecoshape. Kijken naar andere soorten ontwerpen die gebruik maken van de natuur. Ja, daarmee een verrijking zijn voor het landschap. Maar ontwikkelt de zandige versterking en bijbehorende natuur zich als verwacht? Dat wordt nauwlettend in de gaten gehouden door de onderzoekers van Ecoshape in een vierjarig monitoringsproject. In dit project werken onderzoekers samen om kennis en ervaring te verzamelen en te valideren. Nou, we zijn drie jaar geleden begonnen om te kijken van wat kunnen we nou leren van dit project voor toekomstige projecten. We hebben toen besloten dat we gaan kijken naar drie thema's. De voorspelbaarheid van habitatontwikkeling, geometrieontwikkeling en beleving. En daar hebben we een team van mensen bij gezocht die expert zijn op dat gebied. Heel gepassioneerd team met verschillende mensen, ecologen, morfologen, die heel goed samenwerken en samen proberen zo goed mogelijk te verklaren dat wat we in het veld zien en waar dat door komt en hoe we dat dan ook in een volgend ontwerp nog beter zouden kunnen toepassen. Voor een goede interpretatie van de gegevens gaat het projectteam twee keer per jaar het veld in om de ontwikkelingen te bekijken. Zo kunnen patronen in de data worden gerelateerd aan omstandigheden en processen in het veld en vice versa. Er wordt daarbij gelet op de geometrieontwikkeling, de habitatontwikkeling en de beleving van het gebied. Het is een heel groot stuk waar de zee overheen gaat en dat wordt eigenlijk steeds schoongespoeld. Daar dus zie je relatief weinig schelpen aan het oppervlak. Dat is weer goed voor de verstuiving. Dus dat zie je ook wel, dat er daar al ontzettend veel zand naar binnen geblazen wordt. Er was hier niks aangeplant, maar er is toch wat helm opgekomen. Maar ja, ze zien er niet zo heel blij uit. Het begint allemaal een beetje door te worden. Dat komt eigenlijk doordat er niet zoveel extra zand meer, uh, meer bij komt. Dus wat we de komende jaren zullen verwachten, het zal meer diversiteit verschillende soorten gaan we hier zien. Vorig jaar zagen we dat we hier en daar kwam er een tong van zand vanaf deze nieuwe zeereep zo naar achter toe gelopen. Maar nu zie je dat het een heel een kustlangs fenomeen is. Het is dus echt een heel zanddek is er naar binnen getrokken en heeft de boel verhoogd. En we staan hier denk ik ook al drie meter hoger dan het is ja. aangelegd. Ja, het is op vijf aangelegd. Ja, minstens en twee en misschien ondertussen al drie erboven. Ik proef water om te kijken of het aan het verzoet is. In het begin staat hier heel veel zout in. Het moet een natte duinvallei worden met zoet water. En het duurt vrij lang voordat het zoet aan het worden is, maar nu uh, proeft het zoet. Ja, dat is natuurlijk een hele mooie ontwikkeling die je nu ziet hier. Wat ze hier zien, dat zijn de, de embryonale duinen zoals dat heet. Het is de eerste duinvorming vanaf het kale strand. Het is niet zo dat dit per definitie dan een hoge duinregen gaat worden omdat met stormvloeden, vooral in de winter, ook weer een deel van die duintjes gewoon weer verdwijnen. Dus ze komen en ze gaan, bij wijze van spreken. Dit duinswinkgras staat in bloei. Dat is al een soort die een omwenteling naar een vorm van grijs duin laat zien. Nou, hier gaat het goed. 
Vooral daar beneden zie je een mooie natuurlijke duinontwikkeling. Het is het begin van een nieuwe duinerij. En hier, ja, hier stuift het flink op. Dus het wordt langzaam zeker wel wat natuurlijker. Als de helm dood gaat, dan weet je dat het niet zo maar ja, zo'n fietspad is natuurlijk altijd een compromis, hè, want ja. dat is recreatie is belangrijk, dus uh, wordt dat gefaciliteerd. Ja, dat is ja. een dilemma wat speelt in heel veel duizend in Nederland. Naast het veldonderzoek wordt er vier keer per jaar een gebiedsdekkende hoogtemeting uitgevoerd. Deze meting brengt zorgvuldig in kaart hoe de geometrie in het duingebied zich ontwikkelt. Bevindingen en kennis worden gedeeld. Kennis die wordt opgedaan in dit onderzoeksproject van EcoShape leidt tot snellere, betere en goedkopere uitvoering van toekomstige versterkingsprojecten en beter beheer van gerealiseerde projecten. Er zijn nog ook een hele hoop lessen die worden geleerd over hoe Building with Nature ontwerpen in het werk gaat. En die worden dan dus ook doorvertaald naar richtlijnen die je dus kunt gebruiken om vervolg weer van dit soort ontwerpen te maken. In Nederland voeren we overal duin, kust en andere versterkingen uit. En de hele verschuiving naar het versterken van dijken en dammen met natuurlijke materialen, dat proces, dat is onomkeerbaar. En dat is ook hartstikke goed, want daarmee wordt Nederland mooi.